Hi, everybody. After I make these videos, I review them. And I review them to make sure that they play correctly and that there's nothing wrong. Well, guess what? This time there are something pretty major wrong with my recording because I forgot to turn the recording back on after the break. Uh, so I apologize for that. This is uh, the first time this has happened and I'm honestly kind of surprised it hasn't happened before. Uh, but, you know, I'm doing these things in the hopes that they are useful to somebody. Um, I may be spinning my wheels. I've not heard back anything positive or negative about these videos, but uh, with, with the hopes that somebody is getting something useful out of them, it would not do much good. Oh, my hair's a mess. I took a quick shower. Uh, would not do any good to leave half the material out. Um, and it's kind of a shame that I forgot to hit record again because I felt like I was on a roll. The second half was actually very, I thought it was very cool. It's up to Kim to decide or you, honestly, uh, whether or not that's true. But that recording is gone forever. So we're doing something a little unusual today. We're going to do a part A and part B. We're going to recover all of the things that I talked about in the original class with apparently just Kim, since I forgot to hit record. Um, this time, I'm not going to subject poor Kim to uh, listen to it all over again. That just wouldn't do. Uh, so it's just you and me now. Um, you know, we've done that before. That's okay. Ordinarily, I'm very careful about time. I'm not going to be so careful about time this time. Um, I want these things to be like a regular class. <clears throat> but since this is a supplemental, um, it's not going to be more than the normal time. Um, or at least not significantly more. Maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more. I don't know. I'm more interested in covering what we talked about uh, while I was talking with Kim and not you. Uh, okay, sorry, I couldn't resist that. Um, I wanted to be talking to you. I'm just kind of an idiot. That's, you know, I'm a man, so you can't be surprised by that. It's just not allowed. Um, so we're going to re-record this. I'm going to cover the material that I covered uh, that was not recorded. Um, which means that I'm not going to be creating the uh, notes fresh. I'm actually going to be using the notes that I created while talking with Kim. Um, that way I know that I'm going to cover the same stuff. Uh, so I don't fall behind for some of you, but, but uh, you know, building on things that I thought I'd spoken about. We're, we're going to go ahead and we're going to cover this. So I apologize for the mistake. Um, and we are going to pick up where we left off. So the last time you were here, you, last time you were here, okay, I'm going to stop goofing around. Uh, we, we were talking about metabolism. We are talking about the redox reaction. We are talking about the fact that I'm so confused because... Um, we found this mistake. I'm getting an oxidation number of zero for carbon in sucrose. And uh, this, I don't think this can be, uh, but I've not found my mistake. And I am so desperate. I actually went to the web, horrible source of information. Um, and I asked the web what the oxidation number for carbon is in sucrose. and. The web told me that it's plus four. Well, that is worse than my mistake. That is absolutely wrong because if the oxidation number of carbon is four, it doesn't change oxidation states, which means that this entire equation, maybe that's my mistake. Is that possible? If the oxidation number of carbon is four, Four in sucrose, 
and we would have six times plus four plus, now we don't know the oxidation number of hydrogen. And hydrogen can have more than one oxidation number. Uh, plus one is typical. This is 24. Oh, there's my mistake. Aha, found it. The web is apparently correct. I am an idiot. Boy, I, I had a hypothesis as to why I might be wrong. I'm glad I didn't tell you because apparently I'm right. So hydrogen. So carbon is going from, is remaining plus four does not change, but hydrogen is going from minus one to plus one. So hydrogen is actually losing two electrons so it's hydrogen that is being oxidized, not carbon. So yes, I did make a mistake. Wow, that was a dumb mistake too. Actually, it wasn't dumb. I'm glad I found it because now I could correct it. I'm gonna make him watch the second half because she needs to know where I went wrong. So yes, I was wrong. Carbon is actually plus four. Throughout, it does not change oxidation numbers. Hydrogen, on the other hand, goes from minus one to plus one. That's what is being oxidized. Hydrogen in the sucrose, you could talk about the sucrose itself being the reducing agent, but specifically in sucrose, it's the hydrogen that is losing electrons. Okay, we talked a little bit about ADP and ATP. We talked about how uh, uh, catalysts do not change the overall thermodynamics. They change the way the reaction occurs, but you get the exact same change in enthalpy. You get the exact same change in entropy, which means you get the exact same delta G. The presence of a catalyst does not affect uh, the thermodynamics and delta G gives free energy can be related um, to the equilibrium constant expression. So if we have, if we look above here, we're going to draw a little line here because we haven't quite gotten to this part yet, but just ignore what's down here. But if we have a generic reaction between reactants A and B and products C and D, we have something called the equilibrium constant expression, which is related to molarity. Remember those square brackets is concentration and specifically it is molarity, uh, moles per liter. The equilibrium constant expression depends very much on uh, conditions, temperature, pressure, if there's a gas in this pressure, if there's no gas and pressure doesn't affect it. But temperature most certainly. Uh, and of course the reaction, every reversible reaction has its own equilibrium constant expression. And these equilibrium constants are numbers. They can be measured experimentally. So to write down, and there's a lot of mathematics there's a lot of things you can calculate with these equilibrium constant expressions. There are specific types of equilibrium constants um, for different types of reactions. Um, we're not going to go into all that. It's a little beyond the scope of this particular course. 
but there's a lot that you can calculate with these. These are actually very powerful calculations. They're also, even though they're all algebraic, um, they're also quite complex. They get to be, you know, um, higher power quadratic equations, uh, cubic uh, fourth power, fifth power quadratic equations become very difficult to solve, uh, even though they're simply even though they're they're simply algebraic, but they do become very, very involved calculations. This little piece here, by the way, actually belongs down here. So we're going to do that. To write out an equilibrium constant expression, however, it's actually quite straightforward and simple. First of all, always ignore the, the more condensed states. So if you have an equilibrium between solids and liquids, you leave the solids out. If you have solids and gases, you leave the solids out. If you have liquids and gases, you leave the liquids out. You just The reason is very simple. Um, if we have an equilibrium, well, if this is a closed system and I have water in here, uh, we can write the equilibrium constant expression for gas vapor, water vapor versus water liquid. But the water liquid is so condensed that the, con that the amount of it never changes relative to the amount of the gas. Uh, so we don't write it down in the equilibrium constant expression because that concentration acts like a constant. Um, so we don't have to write it down. But um, assuming they're all the same state, you simply put products over reactants and it's the concentration of the products, which is product C, raised to the stoichiometric coefficient. This time, now remember in kinetics, it was not necessarily the stoichiometric coefficient. This time it is. So it's the concentration of product C raised to the power of the stoichiometric coefficient times the product D raised to its stoichiometric coefficient divided by Reactants A raised to its stoichiometric coefficient and B raised to its stoichiometric coefficient. Try saying that four times fast. Um, with this equation, and once you know K, or you can calculate K if you know the concentrations, um, there's just there's so much you can do with these. So for example, I wanted to talk about ozone. Um, the American chemical, I'm sorry, uh, in America, we have a professional chemistry society. Uh, it's called the American Chemical Association, American Chemical Society, sorry, the American Chemical Society. And most chemists belong to the American Chemical Society. I belonged to it at one point in my career. Um, actually, for most of my career, I do not anymore because I don't consider myself an active chemist. Uh, it's quite expensive to belong to, and I just don't make the money for it because you're not paying me for this. Why aren't you paying me for this? This is good stuff. And it's kind of weird because people tend to equate the quality and important importance of something with cost. Um which is kind of strange. I have a friend who used to have a computer repair shop and he wanted to give fair prices. Um, and he had no business at all. Just nobody came in and gave him their business because he was just considered to be cut rate and cheap. Well, he was doing great work. So he raised his prices. And when he raised his prices, he got more business. And he raised his prices again. And he got even more business. So it's kind of strange. He was doing the exact same work, the exact same quality, but he was charging more. So people assumed he was doing a better job. Uh, you're not paying for this. So I don't know what you think about this. Maybe you think this is all garbage. But like I say, I'm hoping somebody is getting something useful out of this. But the American Chemical Society has a newsletter called Chemical and Engineering News. And the first argument, um, and when I say argument, I'm talking about a scientific discussion. Uh, we weren't throwing insults around, we weren't screaming at each other, but I, on the cover of this CNE News one month, it said that chlorine from CFCs are disrupting the equilibrium 
of ozone. Well, this doesn't make sense. Uh, catalysts cannot change equilibrium concentrations. So remember, a system is at equilibrium when the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction. In other words, we are producing products just as quickly as we are consuming them. So the concentrations don't change. It does not mean the reaction stops. The reaction continues, but the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction. And a catalyst will speed up not only the forward reaction, but the reverse reaction as well. So a catalyst does not influence the, the uh, equilibrium of a system. And I took this, this article written by a chemist. And you would think a chemical society would have a chemist checking these articles because it said quite clearly the equilibrium is being disrupted by the uh, presence of the catalyst. CFCs, chloro, uh, fluorochlorocarbons used as refrigerants. Um, and propellants in aerosols. Um, very stable at ground level. You know, I, I had a, I had a, uh, I, I was borrowing a van from a friend and it popped an air conditioning hose and all those CFCs were just released all at once. I was sitting in a sea of CFCs. It was a CFC C, C? Sorry, <laughs> okay. Uh, Breathing them in, they were fine, I'm fine. It didn't do anything to me, it's very stable. It's not toxic. You could suffocate in them, I suppose. Um, but, you know, uh, and and the, the vehicle looked like it was on fire because all of a sudden, all of this white actually turned out to be condensation because the CFCs released were very cold. And you got all this white smoke that kind of flew out from the van, uh, scared the crap out of me. But it was fine. It was just air conditioner stopped, which it was not a good day for the air conditioner to stop. I'll tell you that much right now. Um, on ground level, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. But the problem is, once those CFCs make it up into the atmosphere, the higher atmosphere, they're exposed to high energy ultraviolet rays from the sun. Those high violet rays break the CFCs down to form chlorine radicals, free radicals, which is what this is. Um, the chlorine here, the little dot here, represents an unpaired electron. Remember, electrons love to be paired. Uh, they're no different than you and I. We would like to have a life partner to spend our lives with. I don't. That makes me a free radical. Okay. Not much of a radical as far as radicals go. But free radicals, if you have an unpaired electron, they are highly reactive. Very, very reactive. They're unstable. They're going to get a paired electron from anything possible. And you have seen free radicals. Free radicals are what you see when you have a fire. If you've looked at a candle, that flame What's really happening there is that that flame, the, the candle is so hot that the molecules themselves are breaking down to form free radicals. So you have these bonds, these chemical bonds that involve two electrons and they cleave. It's called hetero, uh, uh, homolytic cleavage. They cleave, which means half the molecule takes one of the electrons, half the molecule takes the other electron. And you end up with a gas of free radicals. Would you stick your finger in that flame? Of course not. That flame is going to burn you. And what it's doing is all those free radicals are looking for electrons to pair with. That's why it is so reactive. Um, so chlorine gets up into the atmosphere and it breaks down the ozone. So we have this reaction in the upper atmosphere between ozone as the reactant and oxygen as the product. Chlorine may or may not be present 
but it doesn't matter. You throw chlorine in there and the equilibrium is the same. So you can write down your equilibrium constant expression. Don't know why I had those parentheses there. So you can write down your equilibrium constant expression just like you did up here. It's products over reactants. So it's oxygen raised to the third power. This is a balanced chemical equation divided by the the concentration of ozone raised to the second power. Chlorine, that chlorine-free radical, it's a catalyst. And I took that article, one of my professors, and I said, this is wrong. Look, it says that the ozone is catalytically disrupting the equilibrium, but catalysts don't disrupt the equilibrium. They can't. And he sat back and he said, well, maybe chemical laws don't apply to systems as large as the Earth. Are you kidding me? If these laws don't apply universally, why are we studying them at all? They have to apply universally. I don't care how big or small the system is. Well, I mean, different set of laws kicks in if you get small enough. Those are the laws of quantum mechanics, but even those add up to the classical limit. These classical laws of thermodynamics must be consistent regardless of the system. The first academic discussion I had with a professor. No, the second, now that I think about it. It was kind of fun. You know, we had this discussion about, well, you know, are these laws all that important? You know, they really are. They really are. But if a catalyst cannot disrupt an equilibrium, what is happening in ozone? And is ozone, in fact, does human activity actually damage the ozone layer? If the chlorine cannot disrupt equilibrium, maybe we're not. Well, the only possible answer is that equilibrium, I'm sorry, ozone is not at equilibrium in the atmosphere. It takes time for a system to reach equilibrium. Here's a fun experiment that you can do with your kids at home. This is one of my favorite chemical demonstrations, and it is so safe, and it is so simple, but it's so cool. Take a clear glass and fill it with water, just plain tap water, and let it settle. You don't want any current, you don't want the water still moving around, but let it settle. So it's a nice still glass of water. Take one drop of ink, which you can get at a hobby store. I happen to carry a fountain pen, so those little ink cartridges in my fountain pen are a great source for just one drop of ink. Um, and put one drop of ink in the water and watch what happens. Well, it's gonna form some very cool patterns, which is why I think that kids would really enjoy this demonstration. And if you want, you can throw in a little scientific discussion with them because what's really happening? The ink is heavier, it's more dense than the water. So as soon as you drop that ink drop into the water, it's gonna to fall to the bottom of the glass. And once it hits the bottom of the glass, it's gonna kind of curl around and kind of fill up the bottom of the glass, not the top. And you're gonna see a line of ink. And that line of ink is gonna cause these little curlies out of them and it's gonna begin diffusing throughout the system. We're gonna talk about diffusion and osmosis here by the end. While it's doing that, it's a, it creates very cool patterns. Your kids will love it. But it takes time. Eventually, and we all know what's going to happen. Eventually, that ink is going to become uniform throughout the entire glass. And you're going to get a glass of sort of a um, kind of a light black color. You know, it's, 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 you're still going to be able to see through it, so it's almost purplish. 
Um, but you're going to get this glass of, of uniform color, but it takes time for that to happen. It takes time for, for systems to reach equilibrium. The very first ozone hole was discovered over the South Pole. Something very strange happens um, ge uh, uh, geologically in the South Pole with its weather patterns. The South Pole gets so bitterly cold in the winter because of the orbit. Earth's orbit is not circular, it's more elliptical. And the South Pole's winter is when the Earth is furthest from the sun. And it gets so cold that the ice crystals that form in the clouds, these are special kinds of clouds, I don't know their name, they will trap the chlorine, the chlorine free radical in them and it'll kind of collect it throughout the winter. Once the summer comes, the first time those ice clouds thaw, all that chlorine is released immediately. So all of a sudden you have this huge dip in ozone concentration and you get the hole. The hole has been expanding. Now I have to admit, I've not kept up with this. So I'm giving you kind of outdated information. Look it up if you're interested. Because we're, we banned CFC use for human use right now. There are other sources of, there are natural sources of CFC, but humans don't use it anymore. Um, so maybe the ozone is beginning to repair itself. I've not heard anything about it in a long time. So maybe it's beginning to repair itself, or maybe it's just not one of the critical issues right now. But that ozone hole over the Antarctic grew and grew and grew until it actually was large enough that there were populated portions of Peru, down south of Peru, that were exposed to light with eventually, essentially, no ozone layer. Um, it actually, that hole became so large that it actually encompassed uh, populated areas. The second hole ever discovered by NASA is not a surprise. It was discovered over the North Pole. The North Pole, of course, does not... Um, okay. The North Pole... Um, once we found it over the South Pole, it kind of makes sense. The next one would be the North Pole. They discovered a third ozone hole. That third ozone hole, believe it or not, over New York City. I cannot think of any possible explanation for an ozone hole to be over a densely populated area like New York that does not include human activity. Maybe there is an explanation, but that lends really strong credence to the concept that human use of CFCs is having a significant impact on our environment. You might say, okay, well, what about Los Angeles? Well, here's the difference between Los Angeles and New York. In New York, New York is an island. So all of the population is trapped right there in the island. And every time stinky people decided to use aerosol sprays, psh, to try and get their pits to smell better, it was over a very small area. Uh, New York City is actually growing horizontally. It cannot, because of physical constraints, because the river, because it's an island, cannot expand width-wise. Los Angeles doesn't have that restriction. So the, con the, the population in Los Angeles is probably, at this point, larger than New York City. They're allowed to expand horizontally as opposed to vertically. So no, we've not seen one yet over Los Angeles to the best of my knowledge, but uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so yes, it, there, there's strong evidence that it is indeed human activity causing the holes in the ozone. And holes in the ozone means that ultraviolet light is being allowed to pass through at a higher rate which leads to problems like skin cancer. So how is it that ozone is not at equilibrium? 
in the upper atmosphere. To understand this, you have to understand how ozone is created. You have smelled ozone before. If you've ever been around an electrical pop and you get that whiff, that smell, that very clean smelling smell of ozone, that's ozone. Ozone is formed in electrical discharges. Turns out around the earth, the equator is where most electrical storms occur. Okay? means that around these the equator ozone is being created now this is and I, I got into kind of an interesting thought about this um, this is the first time i ever really thought about this remember we talked about equilibrium versus non-equilibrium thermodynamics non-equilibrium thermodynamics occurs in extreme situations all right it occurs in explosions for example very high energy, very high heat, very high pressure, where normal thermodynamics doesn't apply um, because it's just too extreme. And by the way, here are your holes. You have your hole over the, over the South Pole, your hole over the North Pole, and here's the hole over New York City, which for some reason I put much further inland than it actually is. Anyway. Non-equilibrium thermodynamics means that the normal laws of thermodynamics do not apply. There are very strange things that happen because there's so much excess energy <clears throat> that the chemistry can do weird things that we're not expecting. So here, amongst all of these electrical storms around the equator, we are forming most of the Earth's ozone. That causes a very high concentration of ozone, which is here, around the equator. Now, diffusion is when a solute flows. Forgot to talk about this earlier. Uh, diffusion is what happens when a solute flows from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. It's the natural thing. When you watch that ink drop experiment, you're going to see, because of the black, you'll see where the black is, is more prevalent in some places, and you still have clear water in others. Well, diffusion means that ink is going to naturally flow from the regions of high concentration out to the regions of low concentration until it is uniform. Same thing happens with the ozone. The ozone is going to diffuse from this region of high concentration where it's being formed towards the poles, towards a region of low concentration. It just diffuses. Um, that's why the poles have always been lower ozone concentration than others, than, than, than the equator. Uh, when we say that the chlorine, well, the chlorine does not disrupt the equilibrium concentration because that's equilibrium thermodynamics. Uh, the non-equilibrium thermodynamics means that we're actually more in a steady state. It's kind of like equilibrium, but we're not at the normal equilibrium. It's steady state, which means it's being created, it's being spent. Um, the chlorine is causing that equilibrium to become, uh, causing that system to reach equilibrium faster. Okay, it's not disrupting the equilibrium. It's forcing the system to reach equilibrium faster, which means the ozone concentration is decreasing. There's not enough ozone to reach the poles, and that's what creates those holes in the ozone. So diffusion is what happens when you go for when you take a solute from a from a high concentration to a low concentration. If you kind of think about it, if you have a high concentration region here and a low concentration region here, and we take that solute and flow it from high to low. First of all, we're losing the solute in the high concentration, which means its concentration is coming down. We're increasing the concentration of the solute in the low region, which means this concentration is going up. What's the system trying to do? Well, it's going to stop diffusing. Well, it doesn't stop, actually. 
Um, but what's going to happen is eventually these two concentrations are going to reach the same level. Once we are at the same level, we are at equilibrium. Once that ink is evenly distributed throughout the water, it reaches equilibrium. Remember the definition of equilibrium. No observable changes over time. Is the ink still moving from one location to another? Well, of course it is. The diffusion actually doesn't stop. But if they're at the same concentration, that means that the solute is moving out of this part as fast as it's moving back in from this part. The exchange is equal. The rate is equal. So at diffusion, um, diffusion, uh, yeah, the, the forward and reverse rates are the same. Osmosis feels different. First of all, diffusion talks about the flow of sol solute. Solute. Remember, the solute is kind of the active ingredient. The solvent is simply the delivery mechanism. So osmosis refers to the flow of solvent. Solvent, osmosis, the flow always goes from low concentration to high concentration. It feels opposite, doesn't it? Instead of going from high to low concentration, it's going from low to high. But think about what's happening now. So again, we have the system, high concentration here, low concentration here. The solvent now is flowing to the high concentration. Well, if we take that high concentration, we add solvent to it. If you take Kool-Aid and you add water, what happens to the concentration? Well, it begins to come down. Down here, we have a solution, but we're removing water from it. So as we remove water, what happens to the concentration of the solute? The solute concentration begins to go up until, once again, the two are the same. In both of these systems, in both of these processes, what the system is trying to do is become equal concentrations on both sides. Okay, we're almost done. So let's talk about membranes. There are three kinds of membrane. I'm just kind of ignore this for the moment. There are three kinds of membranes. We say there are permeable membranes, semi-permeable membranes, and non-permeable membranes. Permeable membranes mean anything. Solute, solvent, Anything can pass through. If you drink tea, and you drink it using those little tea bags, okay, I have to get on my soapbox here. The tea bag is not what makes tea tea. Tea comes from the tea leaf, which is from a tea tree. It's a leaf of a specific tree. That's what tea is. If you are drinking herbal tea, just because it's in a flow through bag, that doesn't make it tea. What you're drinking is potpourri in a bag. That's all it is. So anyway, those flow through bags, whether you're drinking tea or potpourri, they're permeable. They let water flow through. They let chemicals flow out, the, the flavor, flavonoids, the um, the tannic acid, the colorings, all that kind of stuff, all those chemicals, they're free to flow throughout that membrane. Um, that's a permeable membrane. Everything does. It's fine. A non-permeable membrane allows nothing to flow. Right now, it's very cold outside. Kind of a cold day. It's not very cold. It's the beginning of winter, which means that slightly below freezing, which is going to feel balmy from the middle of winter, but we're still early enough in that it feels very cold, even though it's only about 30. And it's starting to snow. Well, I don't want that in my house. 
I don't want cold air in my house. I don't want snow in my house. So what do I do? I set up a non-permeable membrane in the form of glass in my window. The glass is a non-permeable membrane. It doesn't allow air in. It does not allow anything in. Semi-permeable membranes allow some things to flow, but not others. For example, your skin is a semi-permeable membrane. Your skin breathes, and it's important. You can actually suffocate if your skin does not breathe. There's a, a tribe somewhere, and actually it was featured in um, one of the James Bond films, Goldfinger, I think, uh, where they, they murdered a woman by painting her head to toe in gold paint. You can do that. Your skin breathes. You must allow oxygen to pass through your skin uh, or you can suffocate. Um, they say if you leave at least a little bit of exposed skin at the base of the spine, you should be fine, but I wouldn't try it. So if you're going to be in, in paint, if you're using face paint or something like that, just paint the exposed parts. Anything that's enclosed, leave that unpainted. You're, you'll be fine. But your skin is also blocks, uh, it also blocks certain things. It blocks toxins from getting into your skin. It blocks chemicals that don't belong in you from getting into your bloodstream. Uh, if you sit on a toilet seat, it blocks the uh, microbes from getting into your bloodstream. If you have a cut, then chemicals and microbes can get right into your blood. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. It's free pass. That's why we have to disinfect cuts so that they don't get those toxins in there. So your skin is a semi-permeable membrane. Allow some things to flow, but not others. Um, so when we talk about osmosis, we're talking about osmosis through a semi-permeable membrane that allows the solvent to flow, but nothing else, just solvent, usually water. In, in biological systems, it's water. Uh, chemists, we're going to say solvent, so it gets a little more expansive uh, than saying uh, water, because it's not the only solvent. In fact, if you were wearing latex gloves and working with an organic solvent, latex gloves are worse. They are less safe than not wearing any gloves at all if you're working with organic solvents. Uh, like methylene chloride, because the methylene chloride will pass right through that, that latex glove, and the latex glove will actually interfere with the ability of these solvents to evaporate. So if you're wearing those latex gloves, not only are you, methylene chloride doesn't care if you're wearing latex gloves, or not only you're still getting it on your hand, it's keeping it, it's holding it there longer, because it's a semi-permeable membrane. Um, so if we have a cell like this one here, cells inside have a higher salt concentration and they have water. Um, in the intracellular fluid, you have a lower concentration of salt. So osmosis means water wants to flow, wants to flow from the region of low concentration into the cell into a region of high concentration through the semi-permeable cell membrane. Um, diffusion, salt, will want to flow from a region of high concentration out into the intracellular fluid to a region of low concentration. Your cell has mechanisms to control this, so it can actually impede osmosis and diffusion as needed. Um, of course, it can only do it so much. Osmosis creates what we call osmotic pressure. It's an actual force. It's an actual force trying to force that water into the cell. And the cell can only do so much. We talked about hyponatremia before. It means you drink too much water. Too much water means that salt concentration in the intracellular fluid, that low salt concentration becomes even lower. That's why it's called hyponatremia, hypo, lower, 
Natremia, Na from natremia sounds like sodium. Looks like the symbol for sodium. So hyponatremia means that your intracellular fluid normally has this much salt concentration. You drink too much water and that salt concentration begins to drop. If you do it while exercising, it's worse because you, as you sweat, you lose salts. You lose those electrolytes. So you're actually removing the salts if you're sweating. The concentration of the intracellular fluid drops, which means that the osmotic pressure trying to force that water into the cell increases. When that pressure increases, the cell can only do so much. It's crying for help. And as that water flows into the cell, the cell begins to expand and expand and expand, becomes bigger and bigger until eventually it just ruptures. Um, and that's when real damage can be done. Um, okay. I apologize again for having forgotten to hit record, but I think we have caught you up. I'm pretty sure we covered everything we did uh, in the class. So I'm going to begin to convert this and upload it so that you don't fall behind. Thank you for joining me. I am out of here.